morning. I know a, a bunch of you are farmers, and uh, I was out on the farm this week too, helping. And I would, I'll give you a little grace if you give me a little grace uh, this morning. <laughs> but uh, so you probably, maybe you saw in the bulletin, it says I'm talking today about Christian values. And before we talk about values, I, I, w- I wanted to define what values really were because I figured if I was going to talk about them, I should know what they were. And so I, uh, I looked it up on Google, of course. And uh, there's a l- long list of, definition of definitions of values. Um, there were six just initially that showed up on Google, and then you can go and look at the different websites, and it has some more. So I'll just list off some of these uh, definitions. One, the regard that something is held to deserve, uh, the importance, worth, or usefulness of something. Two, a person's principles or standards of behavior, one's judgment of what is important in life. Uh, Three, the numerical value denoted by an algebraic term. Four, the relative duration of the sound signified by a note. So on and such forth. Uh, and then I, I went and looked at some other ones too, and uh, some other ones are something such as a principle or quality that's intrinsically valuable or desirable, or something that's or something's relative worth, utility, or importance. And so when you saw Christian values, you're probably thinking of the same type of ideas when you say fam- family values. Uh, it's what someone believes in and carries out in their life. It's their principles, but it's tied to what they value. If you have family values, you value your family. And, but we all value a long list of things. Whatever we buy, we've placed a value on that. That's why we bought it. Um, we also have value on things that we don't monetarily buy, like hygiene, um, even hard work, uh, time with friends and family, music. There's a limitless number of things that you and I place some amount of value on, and we all have an order. Um, whether we think about that order or not, Certain things are more important than other things. Often our family is more important than our dog. And for some, re- for some people, the dog is very important compared to their vehicle, for instance. And for other people, the vehicle is actually more important than their dog. And that's hard for the dog people to take. And that's, that's the way we are, though. We have different values. There's different things that we consider important in our lives. Now, I want to invite you to just take a second here and think about what you value most. What is the most important thing in your life? As we do this, I think Some of us are ashamed of what we value most. At times in life, we place value on things that we shouldn't. While others of us feel like we're in a pretty good spot. And the Bible, it talks about this. It talks about what we should value most. And so the scripture I want to look at today is Matthew 22, 34 to 40. To create a little backstory for this, the Sadducees are a religious group in Israel. And at the time, they've just asked Jesus a question regarding the resurrection to Jesus, hoping to trip him up. They don't like Jesus, and so they don't believe in the resurrection, so they're hoping to trip Jesus up. Um, But Jesus outsmarts the Sadducees by answering them, and even going so far as to prove the resurrection is real in verse 22, disproving what the Sadducees believed. This surprises the Sadducees, but then we move to the Pharisees, 
which is the group that we're going to be dealing with here, which did not believe, or which did believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so the Sadducees have just failed, and Jesus has answered a question that, uh, that proves that the Pharisees are right on something, but it seems like the Pharisees still want to test Jesus. And so they come in verse uh, 34. It says, But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. And one of them, a lawyer, and by a lawyer, we don't mean a lawyer of uh, the civil law, the Roman law. We mean a lawyer of the Jewish law. So that is our Old Testament. And so he comes to Jesus, and it says, ask him a question, testing him. In verse 36, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. These are commandments we often tend to gloss over. Not because we don't think they're important, but because they seem to us to be such broad, sweeping commandments. It's easier to just focus on the smaller, relatively simpler ones. However, the difficulty of these commandments does not excuse us from following them. These commandments are so foundational that we need to review them. It says here that these two commandments, on these two commandments, depend the whole law and prophets. These are foundational. As we examine the first commandment, it is conclusive. It brooks no room to get out of it. This is the spirit of the law in one sense. It is almost like the constitution of the Old Testament. Even in the Ten Commandments, we look through the reasons for them. And twice the reason is because God commanded it. And another time it is because God is the God who brought them out of Egypt. And how much more has God saved us from sin and even death itself that we should serve him? He has also provided us with life in the first place. He brought us into existence. Now through this earth, he provides us with food and water and everything we need to survive. As it is said elsewhere, we love God, we love Jesus, not because we first loved him. It is because God first loved us. And not just a little. He has proved time and time again that he loves us. He created us. He's provided for us. And when we fell away, he didn't stop. He came back for us. Everything hinges on God. From this life to the next. Even our basic things at their root come from God. Love, family, friends, food, water. You name it. So it should come as no surprise that we have a full stop in verse 38 and it says, this is the great and foremost commandment. There is no other commandment that is more important than loving God. There is no comparison to this. We give him all of our love. Jesus states in Luke 14, 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus asks not for us to love him a little more, than anyone else, not for even a lot more than anyone else, but for the gap to appear so large, so big, by comparison to that love we hate 
everything else. We often talk about how important Christ is. Everything that our Savior has done for us, but it seems far harder to put that value that we have as everything comes from God. He is of infinite value. It's hard to put that into action, into how we live our lives. And this is one of the ways that we do that, by loving God. After Jesus says the first commandment, though, he goes on to say there is one other like it. It's like there's a league, and there's only two teams in this league. One team always wins, but there's two teams. And no others are in the league. This commandment is not ranked the same as the first commandment. There is a foremost commandment. But you, you see the difference between how much love you're supposed to give. With God, it's with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second is as yourself. And so it seems quite a bit less at first glance and it is, to a certain extent, but as yourself is actually a pretty strong statement. Think of all the different ways in which we love ourselves. Love as an action. Maybe not as a feeling, but as an action. We place a massive amount of value on our well-being. I wake up in the morning and I have breakfast. I brush my teeth because I want good teeth. And then I go to work. And I work so that I can have everything that I have, like a house and food. And I come home and I take time off because I want to rest. And I do this for myself. And you think, I, in a sense, yes, we live it for our families too. We go to work and we work our jobs. But part of it is for ourselves. And lots of the things in between those hours, we do for ourselves. And to think, that Jesus asks us, God asks us, to love others that same way. It's no small task. Sometimes it can seem like the harder of the two. Let's turn to Luke 10.28. This is a bit of a parallel passage to the Matthew passage. However, in this case, a Jewish lawyer comes up to Jesus and asks how he can get eternal life. And Jesus, in typical fashion, turns around and asks him what he thinks. And the man replies with the same great commandments. And Jesus says in verse 28, in response to this, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Verse 29, though, is us. <clears throat> Luke writes, But wishing to justify himself, that is the lawyer, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? How often is that us? In any situation. I do this. We all do this. We drive by someone on the side of the road and we're in a hurry. And yeah, maybe they're just on their phone. Or maybe somebody else is probably coming for them. Or whatever. It's just, we have all these different ways, like there's so many reasons that we don't need to stop. Or somebody needs our help, but we're tired and they have other people they can go to. And I'm not saying that there isn't times that we need to rest that we need to take a break so that we can be of more service to others. But I find in my own life, at least, it is so easy for the rest or the fun times to pile up alongside the justifications we have instead of doing the right thing. It isn't just with our time. It also extends to our money and our other resources we might have, vehicles, house. It's so easy to make justifications. But the answer the man receives to the question, who is my neighbor, 
is the parable of the Good Samaritan. One of the most well-known parables. It's why we have the story. It's why we have the uh, Good Samaritan Charity Foundation. And in this story, we have, in this parable, we have a man who's lying wounded on the side of the road. And it is only the person who the Jews hate who stops to help the man lying on the side of the road. It isn't the priest or the Levite. And they have their reasons. If you look into this, you can you realize that they might be worried about getting unclean. And there's also a chance that the man was already dead and to go s- try to save him, maybe he was bait and other robbers would get out and kill them. There was plenty of reasons, justifications, to say no. And pretty good ones, too. Who wants to die? To help a man who is already dead, potentially. But who is the man we are supposed to emulate? The Good Samaritan. Or as the lawyer replies in verse 7, 37, the one who showed mercy toward him. There is a trap that is easy to fall into as Christians, as this expert in the law shows us. As Christians, we seem sometimes to have pledged ourselves to God with everything, but then we turn around and we have serious issues with each other. But in reality, John reminds us that this is not possible. In 1 John 4.20, it's, John writes, If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. Both these commandments are corely related to each other. We can't follow one fully without following the other. How can you love someone without sharing with them the love of Christ? And how can we love God if we cannot love each other? There is a saying we use when we break the letter of the law, but we do the right thing. It's called following the spirit of the law. The Pharisees or lawyers followed many of the laws impeccably. But often throughout the New Testament, Jesus rebukes them because even though they follow the letter of the law, they are breaking the spirit of the law. In the beginning of Matthew 23, there is a long list of issues with the Pharisees that Jesus has with them. One of them is, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law. They're tithing their dill. Now, like, that's crazy. Like, you have your garden plants, and we don't take out 10% of our potatoes, bring it to church, and drop it in the offering. Does, it doesn't even occur to us. And, and there's reasons for that in the New Testament. But Jesus says, you're neglecting the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. They are following some laws to the letter perfectly, but they are neglecting the bigger aspects. For me, following these two greatest commandments is often a very scary prospect. It involves overturning our life's values. Jesus talks about counting the cost as we initially follow him. But it's not even just initially. Time and time again, we're going to have moments in our life where we're going to have to count the cost. There's going to be moments when we're tempted to justify ourselves and to put these two at the top, to value God and others more 
to value God more than ourselves and others as we value ourselves. It's no easy task. We have so many values, values that don't fit into this at all, that can't be reconciled with loving God and others, values that we have and try to keep hidden. We have the values to be, we desire to be better than others and a desire for a good reputation while refusing to actually change or maybe a desire for wealth or even just the newest thing. It doesn't matter what it is and it's so stereotypical to say it. But there's a reason that those aren't, those can't be the most important things in our lives. But there's other values. There's values that are important. There's values like family, food, water, the church. There are things that you should value. But they get dwarfed in comparison with loving God. As loving your family, your love for your family dwarfs the love that you have or the value, it's probably not, can't be called love, the value you place on a piece of clothing. It dwarfs it. It's like a brick to a speck of dust. There's no comparison. But loving God with everything and loving others as ourselves, these two commandments, they dwarf. It's like a mountain compared to a brick. They dwarf everything else. And everything fits in there. Family values are part of it. God wants us to value our family. But our love of God, our value for God, dwarfs that. It's hard to even comprehend that these two giant commandments can dwarf everything in our life by that much. But they do. And this afternoon, this week, when you're sitting in the combine and, or the truck or the swather or you're making a meal or you're just at work on a break or whatever it is, or maybe it's in the morning or the evening when you're doing devotions, I invite you to just take a moment and think about your values. I don't know if we can do this enough to make sure that they're in the right order. And you don't have to stop with just your values of God and the values you place on others. You can keep going down the list. Where's your family on that list compared to your work? Where's your friends on that list compared to your home? I don't know. I know that I have to keep looking at my values myself because I mix it up. I put them in the wrong order. And then, after looking at our values, I invite you to take a moment and reorder them and pray to God and ask for the strength to reorder them. We can't do it by ourselves. There's a reason that there's the fruits of the Holy Spirit and there's the fruits of the flesh. Please bow with me in prayer. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that you've given us beautiful weather for bringing these crops in and that it has been a beautiful summer. As we go through this year and we are challenged, Lord, with so many decisions to make, decisions that test our values, I ask that you would just give us strength, Lord, to make the right decisions. Give us the wisdom. Create in us a love for you that is above all else and that we would love our neighbors, Lord, as we love ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.